Thank you for the introduction and thank you for coming to my talk. Um, so the context of this talk is that JavaScript web applications are event driven and that event handlers in these applications execute asynchronously and non-preemptively in response to both user and system events. The scheduling of these event handlers is performed by the browser and this scheduling is non-deterministic. This non-determinism can lead to various errors such as uncaught exceptions. There actually already exists a wide range of powerful event race detectors for JavaScript web applications. Unfortunately, these are unsuitable for use in practice for a number of reasons. So for example, some of these tools tend to report an overwhelming number of warnings, most of which are spurious. Some either require expensive model checking or static analysis, which is notoriously difficult for JavaScript web applications. And others are platform dependent in the sense that they require or they work by modifying the underlying browsers, which means that they rapidly um, become outdated according to the latest version of the browsers. In this work, we've taken a more pragmatic approach towards event race detection. Um, so specifically, we try to trade some of the generality offered by previous tools by, yeah, for practicality. Um, so in this work, we choose to focus entirely on initialization race errors. These are errors that only manifest during the actual loading of the web page. And I should note that this also includes asynchronously loaded resources. Most specifically, we actually identify three types of race errors that can be detected using lightweight techniques. So these are the target of this talk. In the next couple of slides, I'll try to give an example um, that falls into each of these three categories. The first uh, class of errors we call form input over written errors. Um, so here is a simple web page to illustrate uh, what such an error could look like. So as you can see here, the web page is currently loading. And at this point, the, uh, a form field has already been visible uh, on, the, on the actual screen here. So at this point, the user could start writing text into this text field. At some later point during the initialization, though, a piece of JavaScript might update the value of this text field, which overwrites the user's input, uh, which can be extremely annoying to, to the user. Uh, so here is a, a small snippet that we found on a real-world website uh, that does exactly this. So the first line here extracts the query, param query parameter called Q from the URL or takes the empty string if there's no such query parameter. And then the very next line updates the search field using that value. The next class of errors we look for here is called late event handler registration errors. So you could imagine that this search field here has an auto-completion feature so that the website provides some suggestions for the user when he starts typing. Such a feature would usually be uh, implemented along the following lines. So here, autocomplete is a function which is registered as an event handler for the key down event on the given search field. The problem about this line of code here is that uh, by the time it's, uh, this line is executed, the form field could already have been visible on the screen for a while, which means that the user could already have started typing characters before this event handler has been registered. In this case, it means that the user uh, the user's input is simply ignored by the web application, and this feature doesn't work. The last class of errors we look for is called access before definition errors. Um, so in the example with the auto-completion feature, the consequence of such an error is the same in the sense that the auto-completion feature is not going to work during the loading of the web page. It manifests in a slightly different way though. So here, um, such an error gives rise to an uncaught reference error saying that the function also complete is not defined. Here is a, a simple uh, piece of code that demonstrates how this might happen. So this is the HTML that declares the input field here. And down here on the second line, it registers an event handler for the key down event, which invokes the, the autocomplete function. The problem is that the autocomplete function here might only be defined at a later point during the loading of the web page, which means that if the user triggers a key down event early on during the, the loading of the web page, then this also complete, oh, resolving this identifier here would lead to an uncaught reference error. Uh, 
So in this work, we observed that these three types of errors can actually be uh, identified by eagerly inserting events into the execution. This gives rise to a scenario where events occur immediately, um, which is um, basically a scenario that developers would rarely observe during ordinary testing. So in a, in a little more detail, um, for the form input over written errors, as soon as an input field gets declared, we would go ahead and change the value of this text field. For these late event handler registration errors, as soon as an HTML element gets declared, we would simulate all the event types that are supported by that element. And finally, for the access before definition errors, as soon as an event handler gets registered, either in the HTML or the JavaScript code, we would go ahead and execute that event handler. So one important uh, property here is that this is, uh, methodology is actually independent of a given user event sequence, unlike um, the other dynamic, uh, the, unlike the existing dynamic race detectors for JavaScript. Specifically here, during the loading of the web page, um, our technique simulates all the possible uh, events that are supported by the web page. So in the next couple of slides, I'll try to give some more details about how we detect these form input over written errors and these access before definition errors. For the form input over written errors, our technique works by instrumenting the HTML and JavaScript source files and then loading the instrumented web page in the browser. At some point during the loading of this instrumented web page, uh, a form field might be declared. So at this point, the instrumentation goes ahead and updates the value of this text field. Um, because this is the earliest point during the execution at which the user could do the same thing. At a later point, say that a piece of JavaScript updates the value of the text field. The instrumentation intercepts that, and in that case we have an execution that witnesses there is a form input over written error, so we can issue a warning to the user here. So this approach provides a very simple race detector for this kind of issue. Um, so there is uh, so for some scenarios, actually, our technique would not go ahead and issue a warning in this case. And the problem is that some harmful interleavings may be extremely unlikely in practice. So to motivate this, consider this simple HTML snippet here. So in the first line, a input field is declared. Um, and in the very next line, a piece of JavaScript updates the value of this text field. So it is technically possible for the user to um, interfere with the text field before this line of code executes, but in practice it's never going to happen. In Eraser, our technique models the execution as a trace. So when it observes the, that, the, uh, the, that the form field is being declared in the HTML, it's going to emit an, an operation HTML element start here in the trace. Later on in the same execution, when the, a piece of JavaScript updates the value of that text field, initRacer is going to emit an operation called write form field. These two operations belong to their own events, EI and EK here. initRacer only reports a warning if there exists another event, EJ, such that the timing of EJ is dependent on the network. That means that it may take a while for EJ to execute if you're on a slow network. And then we require, according to the happens before relation, that this event EJ happens in between the first operation HTML element start and the write form field. Together, these two requirements actually guarantee that the reported form input over written errors are likely to manifest if you're on a slow network. Regarding these access before definition errors, initRacer works along the same lines by dynamically ins or instrumenting the HTML and JavaScript source files on the fly. Um, for detecting this kind of error, our tool loads the instrumented web page in, in something we call adverse mode execution. In this execution mode, we aggressively invoke every single event handler that is being registered during the loading of the web page um, as soon as it's re being registered. Um, so for some websites, this is going to lead to potentially a number of crashes. Um, the problem about this simple 
technique here is that some of these crashes might be extremely unlikely in practice. Uh, the problem is that this execution mode provides a very unusual scenario where um, we could simulate, let's say, 100 user events during the loading of the web page, which will never happen in a real uh, user scenario. For that reason, we take each of these crashes individually and la launch uh, an instrumented web page in what we call validation mode. So in this mode, we try to execute only one of the event handlers that were crashing in the adverse mode execution. And if we can reproduce the crash using just one user event during the loading of the web page, then we report this crash to the, the client of our tool. So for the evaluation, we performed an experimental study on 100 real world websites from the Fortune 500 list. Specifically, we looked at the top 100 websites. Um, and we asked how many warnings that initracer reports on those websites, and also how often these warnings actually lead to uh, or identify real errors in these websites. Regarding the first research question, we found that initracer on those 100 websites reported 24 warnings uh, of the form input over written kind. It reported approximately 750 warnings or late event handler registration warnings. Here I've split them into warnings that are related to the registration of user events and those that are related to system events. The motivation for this distinction is that um, late event handler registration for system events are generally more problematic. Uh, specifically for user events, the user can in many scenarios go ahead and simply repeat his or her user event, whereas that's not the case for, for system events. Um, and then we found that Enid Razor reports 247 uh, warnings of the access before definition kind, which are uh, due to crashes that has been detected on those 100 websites. Um, so from this, uh, I think it's fair to take away that Initracer um, produces a manageable amount of, of warnings for these 100 websites. Uh, so in comparison, we took uh, Event Racer and ran it on uh, some of these uh, websites that ha we have in our, our suite here. And on some of these websites, uh, this tool reported more than 1,000 races just for one of them. Regarding the identification of actual errors, we manually, in, in, we manually investigated all the form input over written warnings that has to do with uh, text fields. Then we manually invested all data event handler registrations that, uh, from 10 randomly selected websites that had at least one of these warnings. And we did the same for all the access before definition warnings. In total, this gave us 218 warnings. And from the manual in investigation, we found that 47 of those identify errors that somehow affect the user experience. So this could be that some functionality is not working during the loading of the web page, or that the user's input is being overridden by a piece of JavaScript. For 111 warnings, uh, they identified crashes that were reproducible but not didn't really uh, affect the user experience. Um, so whether or not these are issues that the developer would really care about is uh, very subjective. Um, so some would say that this is not really an issue and other would argue that um, it's important not to uh, reveal these uncaught exceptions because it, gives a, it might give a bad impression to, to the user of the website. Uh, for first scene of the warnings, they were not reproducible because the UI element that were involved in the race was not visible. In the implementation, we use a third party library for determining visibility. And by improving that third party library, we would be able to reduce this number. In 11 similar cases uh, or similar warnings, they were not reproducible. Um, these were for technical uh, reasons and there's a, uh, some more details in the paper. For the remaining 36 warnings, these are uh, basically identified that some analytics uh, libraries are not working during the loading of the web page, and these are uh, likely harmless. Uh, one way to get rid of those would be to disable the use of analytics during the loading of the web page while the anal analysis is running. Um, so when we were doing this manual study, we um, 
looked, uh, we had to investigate all of these warnings manually in detail. Um, so for this, we found the, uh, the reports that are automatically generated by our tool very useful. Um, so here is the report that's generated for apple.com. And in the bottom of the screen here, you can see that the tool has taken a screenshot of the web page after the analysis has been run. At this point, uh, the tool is able to uh, highlight all the UI elements on the screen that are actually involved in a race. Um, so here, uh, the text says uh, LEHR, which is an abbreviation of Late Event Handler Registration. And it also says that it's for the click event. And it also provides the ID of the corresponding warning. Um, up here, it's possible to tell that this correspond or this particular race is uh, involved or uh, has to do with the anchor element that is declared on line 146 in the source code. And there is also a stack trace that uh, identifies the place in the source code where the corresponding event handler is actually being registered. Um, so I think this is one of the advantages that we get from focusing of, on the, these three types of initialization race errors. Um, because we're able uh, to provide debugging information that's relevant to each of these different kinds of warnings. Um, as opposed to providing information such as saying that there is a race on property X of object 342. So in conclusion, I've presented our technique that we call init racer. This is a simple and lightweight technique, um, which, uh, uh, which, we, which is, um, sorry, which uh, can be used to detect these three types of initialization race errors. Um, init racer mimics a scenario where uh, these events occur as soon as possible, which mimics a scenario that developers would not no normally observe during ordinary testing. The tool is independent of a given user event sequence because it simulates all the user events during the loading of the web page. It also ignores errors that are practically unlikely um, and it's platform independent because it works using instrumentation unlike previous approaches. Um, we applied our tool to 100 real world websites and it reports approximately 1,000 warnings. And we found that the tool provides reports that are uh, informative um, and provides good information about the causes and effects of, of these uh, issues. Thank you.